All right, uh, I wanted to show you something about the coordinate system uh, issue uh, that we're going to discuss in class on Friday. I'm recording this a little bit in advance. I'm recording this on Wednesday, uh, but uh, I wanted to do this while it was fresh in my mind, and so this would be a good video to watch after the lecture on Friday. Uh, I want to go back to the example that we did uh, on Wednesday and that I expanded upon during uh, uh, during that, that that supplemental video. So what we were trying to do was determine the deflection uh, of a beam. It was a simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load, and we were trying to determine the deflection right here uh, using virtual work. So what we ended up getting was this. We got a real moment function that worked for the entire beam, but then we had two virtual moment functions. We had one that was two thirds X, and then this is actually kind of important. The other was 10 minus one third X. And so what that meant was when we evaluated the integrals, we had one integral from zero to 10 of this times this, but we had another integral uh, from 10 to 30 of this times this, okay? And so when you multiply this times this, you have to foil it, okay? Now, if you're plugging this into a Casio or, or your calculator and having it just do all the integration for you, it doesn't matter. Um, the calculator doesn't care. But if you're doing this by hand, um, there's something that you might uh, want to um, consider, uh, and that's looking at uh, two coordinate systems. So let's take this, uh, this beam, and now let's expand upon looking at two coordinate systems. So in class on Friday, we're gonna discuss how you can take a coordinate system and move it, and it really doesn't matter. I could take this coordinate system uh, and move it here, I can move it here, move it here, it doesn't matter. But what you'll find is that uh, the most advantageous place to put the coordinate system is at the end of the beam with the x-axis facing towards the beam. So for this uh, for this problem, you could have the, the coordinate system over here with the x-axis facing towards the beam, or you could have it flipped, okay? And you could have the x-axis facing this way uh, towards the beam. Uh, and you might think to yourself, why would you do that? Isn't that making it too complicated? Actually, it's it's not from an algebra perspective. It's actually making it easier, and I'll show you why. So here's your virtual moment function. And again, your moment diagram is piecewise linear. It goes up here uh, and then down there. Well, if we look at M1, M1 was just defined as two-thirds X, okay? And the reason it was just two-thirds X and there wasn't, you know, like a plus 10 or a number was because it was going through the origin. So the X-intercept was zero. And so that made a little bit of the algebra kind of easier for us. So what I propose is that we uh, we use that function that we got before. You know, we had two thirds x. We use the two thirds x, but I'm going to call that x one. And I'm going to define a new coordinate system uh, x two going this way. So we'll have an x two this way, and then this will be x one going that way. The reason why is because if I use this coordinate system for the moment diagram on this side, keep in mind again the moment diagram is going to come up and go down like that. If I use this coordinate system for this function, then instead of 10, instead of that pesky little 10 there, the 10 disappears because the, for, according to that coordinate system, the moment function goes through the origin. Now, you have to kind of be a little careful on this because you're flipping the axes. What happens is you flip the sign because if you flip the axes, imagine taking this beam and literally turning it, flipping it 180 degrees. If you take this beam and you flip it 180 degrees, when you draw your shear diagram, this is going to be the first thing that you draw, not the last. So the first thing you're going to do is jump up and then, then move over. So your shear diagram is going to start with a positive value. So your moment diagram, if you flip the coordinate system, that slope would be positive. Okay. So hence why, you know, you know, when you flip the coordinate system, you're flipping that. Now, why are you flipping this, but not flipping the signs here? See, the nice thing about flipping the coordinate system is that the beam is symmetric. So whether you look at it this way or look at it this way, you're still getting the same beam. Why does this not change? Because of the distributed load. The distributed load is acting downward across the entire beam, regardless if you have the beam flipped this way or this way. So regardless of how you flip it, when you cut a section and look towards the support, you're always gonna see that negative value of that load going downwards. So that's why you get the same function. So a new way of setting up this integral is like this. So what we'll do is we'll integrate, you know, this function times the moment from zero to 10. And this function, instead of going from 10 to 30, we'll just integrate from zero to 20 because it's not 
with respect to X, it's with respect to X1 and X2, okay? Different coordinate systems mean different variables. Why, now think, that by doing it this way, you're gonna make two things easier on you. I wanna go back to the first thing is the foiling. If you do this by hand, what you're gonna find is by doing it this way with two coordinate systems, you're not gonna have to foil this times this, just like you didn't have to foil this times this, makes the math a little easier. But the other thing that's easier, and I think this kind of gets lost sometimes, at least maybe when, when I teach the class, I don't kind of impress upon this, are the limits, okay? When we did the, uh, when I did the integral of this by hand, one of the things you found is, you know, this first integral didn't change. We still evaluated this integral from zero to 10. So think about how you do that. You plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number, but the bottom number is zero. So it makes the math a lot easier. Whereas over here, before we had an integral from 10 to 30. So we had to plug in the top number minus plug in the bottom number, a lot of, a lot of plugging and chugging. Here, we're evaluating from zero to 20. So plug in the top number minus and then the bottom number zero. So it makes the second integral just as easy as the first integral was. So the two coordinate systems might seem a little complicated the first time that you do it, but the more that you chug, uh, chug out these problems, what you'll find is that by using two coordinate systems, you're actually making the grunt work that you have to do a lot less labor intensive. You're not having to foil and you're using more integrals with a base limit of zero, you know, evaluated from A to B. If that A value can be zero, it makes chugging out the integrals a lot easier to do.